Yeah. Off now. Uh, before introducing the speaker, I'll just introduce myself. Uh, my name is Lars Boyan Mortensen, uh, and I'm the current head a uh, chair of uh, humanities at DS. And this partly explains why we have such a strong showing of medieval uh, papers this uh, this semester. Uh, but it doesn't mean that humanities are only medieval. We are rolling out a bigger program in, in the coming. Uh, semesters uh, that, that hopefully will cover most of the humanities. Um, our group uh, in medieval uh, literature uh, has been connected to our speaker, Professor Jeff Ryder, for quite some time. I, I don't remember exactly how long, but uh, I want to uh, say that Jeff uh, Ryder, who is a professor in, uh, in literature, the literature and history of medieval Europe in Wesleyan University, um, has been a, a, a very supportive figure for our group here at SDU and in York, where, where we are also, uh, we have the, uh, another group that, that's working together with us. Uh, and, and Jeff has been very supportive in setting up the, the whole CML, but also in, in following it. And for us, it's, um, it's especially fitting that he could actually spend a whole semester here now as a Fulbright uh, scholar. Um, and uh, in the spirit of DS, we can really say that we are competing with the big guys now because uh, Jeff has had a Fulbright professorship in Paris and in Brussels, but now finally he has made it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, um, and Paris and Brussels are for places of great resources for medieval studies. Um, as, but in a way, we could, we could claim that, that your visit here is a, is a culmination so far of an excellent and itinerant <laughs> career. Um, Jeff's speciality is uh, uh, French and Latin literature from the 11th to the 13th century. Uh, and he has done a lot of research on a remarkable chronicle by Galbert of Bruges uh, from the 12th century. And uh, Jeff is also a key scholar uh, in bridging the gap uh, between historiography and fiction, so chronicles and literature. Uh, but also uh, bridging the gap between Latin and French. Um, and he is known for his very uh, concrete and, I think in your own words, hands-on approach uh, uh, to these old texts. And I think by hands-on you mean on the manuscripts and on the, on the languages. Uh, but uh, he has another and more philosophical side as well. One of his edited books is not for beginners, it is entitled Obscurity in Medieval Texts. Today he will also be philosophical, I think, uh, but pro probably less obscure when he talks about the usefulness of the Middle Ages. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. So it's, uh, it is a real pleasure to be here in warm, sunny Odense, uh, <laughs> where we're very much looking forward to the spring. Uh, as I think all of you probably are as well. But it, it actually is, we've been here for a month now, and it's been both the university and the town have been wonderful places. We've been very happy here and have not felt much of a uh, culture shock at all, actually. Uh, so it's, it's been very great for us. Uh, I also want to start by thanking also, I have to officially thank the Fulbright Commission for uh, the Danish American Fulbright Commission for uh, giving me a grant that allowed me to come here uh, for a semester. Um, it's paid for mostly by your tax dollars, uh, but by some of my tax dollars too, so uh, we're, we're working this out. And I want to encourage all of you and any of you to uh, think about applying for a Fulbright grant. Uh, these exchanges are specifically between the United States and other countries, but there's, in each uh, European country anyway, there's a commission that oversees this, these exchanges, and they're, um, uh, this is my third one, and I found all of them to be absolutely <coughs> terrific and wonderful ways to encounter other people and so on. So I encourage you to think about uh, applying for these uh, for the United States. And mine have been in the humanities, obviously, but actually most of these are for uh, are more in the sciences than in the humanities, although they try to keep them as equal as possible. But it's not just for uh, the humanities. Uh, and then finally, I want to thank uh, the Center for Medieval Literature for hosting me. Um, uh, you may not be aware of it, all of you, but uh, the center is, in my opinion, at the moment, the most important center for the study of medieval literature in Europe and therefore probably in the world. 
So you should feel uh, fortunate to have it here uh, uh, at the Southern Denmark University. Um, so what I would like to do today is introduce the main ideas behind this book project that I'm working on, on the usefulness of the Middle Ages. Uh, this will be, I, I, I've realized over time that in different cultures there are different traditions for presenting. In the American uh, tradition, normally one reads a paper, and so I will be doing a lot of reading, and I apologize if that seems offensive to you. If, if, I, if, American, if you come to the United States, you should read a paper because otherwise we don't think you've done your work. Uh, so, uh, so the ultimate source of this book is probably my experience as a medievalist in the United States. The remnants of the European Middle Ages are not very visible or present in the United States. Uh, and the European past seems to be less and less part of the American past with the changes in immigration in the United States since World War II, although immigration may be coming to an end in the United States. So. Um, but the, just interestingly, since World War II, the seven countries that have sent the most immigrants to the United States are China, Nigeria, India, Brazil, Bangladesh, Mexico, and the Philippines. Okay, so it's completely non, it has stopped being a European immigration to the United States, and the United States population is becoming increasingly Asian. Um, every conscientious American medievalist who has received his or her PhD since the 1970s, let's say, has had to ask him or herself about the value of his or her work at at least some point in his or her career. The situation is aggravated by the fact that academic programs in the social and human sciences are usually highly flexible in the United States, and the study of the Middle Ages is probably not required of students anywhere anymore. Teachers of useless subjects, such as literature and history, are under increasing pressure to explain to administrators and students and their parents the value of studying their subject. I have thus been thinking about the value of studying the history and literature of the Middle Ages for some time now, and I think I have finally arrived at an explanation which satisfies me, at least. This explanation is based on three assumptions, perhaps I, sub I should say three convictions. The first is that every human being wants to be happy, wants to live a good life, and that all our actions aim, consciously or unconsciously, at achieving this goal. Each person will have a different idea of happiness and a good life, and the human mind is so complex that in some sad but fortunately relatively rare cases, even pain and self-destruction may seem to be sources of happiness. I am convinced, however, that every human being wants to be happy according to his or her own criteria, and that all our actions can therefore be said to be more or less useful insofar as they help us to be happy and live a good life. The second conviction is that human beings never deliberately do anything unnecessary. Or, in other words, that all human actions aim at achieving happiness, although each person probably conceives of happiness in a different way. And this notion goes way back to my undergraduate days when I used to watch kittens play when I was trying to study for exams and so on. And I read some articles in psychology and so on about play actually as a form of practice. That is, that when people play, they're actually practicing for this, so that there is no such thing as really useless, pointless activity. It all has some, uh, some point, some function. Thirdly, I am convinced that pleasure is the way in which nature directs human beings towards useful action. When one does something useful, which contributes to one's happiness, one feels pleasure. Or in other words, pleasure is a sign of usefulness. If then, I like to do research in the Middle Ages and read its stories, if that pleases me, it is because these activities are useful to me. They make me happier than I would be if I did not pursue them. They help me live a better life than I would if I did not pursue them. What escaped me for a long time was the why and how of this. Why and how do research on the Middle Ages and reading its stories make me happier? I discovered the answers to these questions in the hermeneutics of Paul Ricoeur and the discovery of mirror neuron systems. But before turning to these answers, I would like to clarify four points 
in order to avoid the misunderstandings I encountered in my first discussions on the subject. First, the usefulness of the Middle Ages is not based on the relevance or the modernity of the Middle Ages. In fact, I think that the Middle Ages are useful to us precisely because they are not modern or relevant. It is the antiquity and irrelevance, the otherness of the Middle Ages, that make them useful. Second, the usefulness and happiness that interest me are individual and psychological rather than collective and political. Much has been written, for example, about the importance of the notion of medieval empires in the development of the European Union, or, in the importance, or of the importance of the idea of the crusade in Western policy towards the Middle East. But I'm not interested in these collective political uses of the Middle Ages. Third, I have chosen to write about the usefulness of engaging with the vestiges of the Middle Ages because this is the period I know best. But the argument in the book applies to a commitment uh, to an investigation of the vestiges of any other period of the past, or in fact an engagement with any time or place, any world we do not feel to be our own. Finally, to show that a researcher studies a subject for subjective or personal reasons, private and particular reasons, is often a way of criticizing and invalidating his or her work. I think, on the contrary, that the best and most important reasons for studying a world that is not our own are subjective and personal. Okay, so I'm going to talk first then about uh, mirror neurons and any of you who are uh, specialists in the field will realize this is very, very simple. So, okay. When we see an object, the motor neurons in our brain automatically and pre-consciously perceive the object's affordances. The properties, the shapes, the surfaces that facilitate our manipulation of the object and suggest ways in which it can be manipulated. So an affordance is just simply my brain automatically sees that I can pick this up how to do this, that I'm probably going to pick it up this way rather than picking it up this way, that I can drink from it, I can take the cap off, I can throw it. Uh, it the brain automatically tells me all these things that I can do with this the moment I perceive this, before I touch it. These affordances can be natural or artificial. And when humans make or modify objects, they provide them with artificial affordances that suggest and facilitate the manipulation of the object for the purposes for which the manufacturer intended it. So putting a handle on a cup, for example. Thanks to its affordances, an object evokes in the brain the small motor acts that conform to them. I do not, in fact, perceive a static world of objects around me, but a dynamic world of possible actions. That's my perceptions of things includes their use. This is as true of medieval objects as it is of modern ones, and insofar as the affordances of a medieval object evoke motor acts that are unfamiliar to us, they enrich and broaden our vocabulary of motor acts. Some of these unfamiliar motor acts may not be directly useful in everyday life, but once they are part of our cerebral repertoire of motor acts, they can be evoked by everyday objects. The perception of a medieval object can therefore help me to see more practical opportunities in the world and to imagine more possible actions than I could see before I perceived the medieval object. When I imagine, execute, and refine movements evoked <coughs> by medieval objects, moreover, I learn old movements, but which are new to me, and these may suggest new ways to manipulate or move in relation to modern objects. Okay. And I'm going to give examples of all this in a minute. So. Um, we also have a mirror neuron system that allows us to understand the movements of other people and their intentions by imagining what our intentions would be if we performed the, those movements. So I see someone pulling out a gun, and I know what I would be thinking if I were pulling out a gun, and so I run. This is the way that we do it. Uh, and a system of visceral motor mirror neurons that evoke in us the emotions 
that the motor acts we perceive would evoke in us if we performed them. And the most obvious example here is that if I see someone crying, my brain says, if, if you were doing that, what would you be feeling? Okay, and this is the basis of empathy and sympathy for other people uh, as well. Through these mirror neuron systems, we can imagine the intentions of other people, learn to do things by watching someone else do them. This is the basis of, oh, I, I used to coach soccer. So if you want to show someone how to football, or if you want to show someone how to play do things, you would show them, and they can watch you and at least learn the basics simply by watching thanks to this mirror neuron system. And sympathize with others. This allows us to sympathize with others as well. When our motor neurons suggest actions related to an object of the past, our visceromotor mirror neurons also suggest emotions related to these actions. Insofar as the perception or imagination of movements with respect to an object of the past provokes internal motor representations, it will also provoke internal visceromotor representations of the feelings associated with those mo these movements. If I refine and re reinforce these movements through experimentation and practice, I will also refine and reinforce the feelings associated with them. The perception of a medieval object in some, let's say a sword, especially if I can see or can imagine that object being manipulated, manipulated by someone, automatically and pre-consciously evokes in my brain certain potential motor acts and feelings associated with these acts that would not be evoked by a contemporary object. And once these motive and motor acts and feelings are part of my neuronal vocabulary, they can be evoked by other objects too. My motor and visceral motor vocabularies are thus expanded and I see more opportunities to act in the world than before and I have a wider range of feelings than before. The world becomes richer and denser. Medieval objects enrich the present because they offer us the opportunity to enlarge our motor and visceral motor vocabularies by generating a set of neuronal representations of motor acts and associated feelings that are at least partially different from those suggested by any modern object. Without these objects of the past, our motor and visceral motor repertories would be smaller, simpler, and less rich. Since the affordances of an object are in the first instance perceived visually, replicas can evoke, at least to some degree, or uh, simulacra, if you know, simulation, simulacra, can evoke to at least some degree the same internal motor and visceral motor representations as authentic artifacts. <coughs> uh, the visual affordances of a good plastic replica of a medieval sword, for example, will evoke the same internal motor and visceral motor representations as the original. What's important in this, what's important with this, this plastic sword, for example, is if I see a plastic sword that is a very good replica of an actual, so if this were a plastic sword, see that's a very good replica, and I see it, it does the same thing to my brain as my seeing the actual authentic object. The difference comes in when I want to manipulate it, when I want to learn to use it and so on, because then the plastic doesn't weigh as much as the original sword and so on and so forth. But the material composition of the rep replica matters only when I manipulate it, not when I see it. Um, um, so let me now give you some examples of this. Okay? And the first is simply this, that part of the idea for this book came when I went to an exposition at the Musée de Cluny in, in Paris on medieval swords, or on swords through history. And at the end of the exposition, it was a great exposition in the, in the, in the Roman baths, which are part of the Museum of Cluny. And at the end, they had a huge plexiglass box with a sword inside, and a little cutout where you could put your hand in to grab the sword, and the sword was chained, so you couldn't find it. Uh, but you put your hand in the sword, and so everybody could put their hand in the box, grab the sword, and do what they want with it. I sat there for 45 minutes watching everybody come through and put their hand in the box and grab the sword. Everyone, Japanese tourists, American tourists, African tourists, French people, kids, adults, grandparents, did exactly the same thing. 
Okay, they all grabbed the sword, they all brandished it in the box, they all went like this, and they did exactly the same thing. Now, part of that is probably because we've all seen movies uh, where people are using swords and so on, but also the use of the sword is actually written and scribed in its surface for our brain. No one tried to pick up the blade of the sword. Okay? Everyone recognized this is a handle and picked it up by its handle. So these things are inscribed in these uh, things themselves. <coughs> now what I want to show you here is that in uh, Burgundy, they are building a castle called Gedelon, which is uh, modeled on a 13th century castle. And they put a lot of research into this. And they're building it insofar as they can using 13th century methods. So what I'm showing, going to show you here is one long segment, but it's two things. They were making, they dug a well. So now they need a pulley and a rope to put the bucket down in the well. Okay, so we're going to see them make the <coughs> pulley uh, and the rope for, for the bucket. Okay. Peter's commissioning a pulley from Wood Turner, Gary Baker. One of the first stages to select a, a log. Yeah. And the pulley's going to be in this direction. Okay. So you could just cut a, a like, section through a, a log <coughs> and just do that as a pulley. That would never work. Really? The problem with the end grain, it, yeah. it shrinks at different levels and it, it's just going to split apart. Oh, yeah. So it's going to follow the grain this way. We're just going to rough chop it. <laughs> What's the wood that you're using? This is uh, ash. Ash is very a very dry wood, and therefore when it dries, it doesn't doesn't move that much. It's not going to warp and crack. A mandrel is hammered into the centre of the roughly shaped wood, so it can be turned on a pole lathe. Pole lathes like this have been used both in England and France since before the 10th century. So it's just a pedal, pulling the string around the mandrel, yeah, onto and a flexible pole. And a pole basically all it does is lift the pedal back up. The roughly shaped ash is turned to make a cylinder. I can say, uh, what's new? That's really, really hypnotic. Uh, it is, it is. Uh, it's like the gymnasium, maybe a evil <laughs> gymnasium. But you do get fit. As well as a pulley. They'll need a rope for the well. Rope is essential on a medieval building site to lift loads and bind scaffolding. Tom's commissioning a rope for the well from the castle's rope maker, Yvon Elwa. First, he lays hemp yarns along the rope walk to form four strands, each with 14 yarns. I can definitely see why this is called a rope walk. All we seem to do is walk up and down. This 15 metre rope, it's actually walked half a mile. It's extraordinary. The four strands are now complete. Next, they must be twisted together. First stage of the twisting, we'll actually reduce the length of these strands by about 10%, so that's about 1.5 metres. So, I'm estimating, that's about there. When the traveller hits this mark, Yvonne knows the rope has been twisted the optimum number of times. Very slowly, the traveller's moving in. But with each turn that Yvonne does, we get to the I see as being right. Gary's turning the cylinder into a pulley by cutting a groove in its rim. have been twisted to form strands. <coughs> then the strands are twisted in the opposite direction to form the finished rope. To make the strands, you twist the yarns in one direction. To make the rope, you twist the strands against each other. That way you create that tension and that torsion and it stops them unraveling. Okay, 
Now, uh, we'll something else in a minute, but I want to say immediately, right away, there, there are things, that, at least when I watched that, that I learned just very dramatically. I mean, I've seen, obviously, twigs and saplings be twisted and so on, but to think you could use it as a spring is something that I would not have thought of before I saw this. Also, if you'd given me this object that he was using at the end to twist the ropes together, if you'd given me simply the object, I could have imagined a lot of different uses for it, and I would have wondered what it was, but now that I see it, I know what, how that object can be used, which would then perhaps suggest to me that that's something that I do in my daily life, okay, that I'm going to see something vaguely sim uh, similar to what I saw here, and what I saw here will then help me with that. So I mean, I, what I, by watching this, I'm actually enlarging my way of thinking about using things and about the things that can be used. Also, there are emotions involved in this. That if you, at one point he said, watching you is like, uh, is really hypnotic. Okay, and the guy said, it's like being at the gym. And I guess he meant like by running on a treadmill or something. But, uh, but there are emotions attached with these things as well. The rope walk, I don't know if you caught this, but he said to make a 50 meter rope, he had to walk, I don't know what it was, half a mile or something like that, because you're walking back and forth and back and forth. So you're actually taking a half mile walk okay, while you're making a rope. And presumably, it's you're thinking about things. I mean, I can imagine what I would be thinking about, what I would be doing during that sort of spring. So we're not only seeing the things being made and being used, but we're also uh, understanding some of the emotions involved with uh, the use of these things. Now, the next thing I'm going to show, the next couple of things I'm going to show, are about jousting. And I want to say a little bit about this. So that what happened uh, mostly in the, US, in the U.S., at least in the 1970s, is there were a great many Renaissance <coughs> fairs where you would go and people would be dressed up and they'd be serving Renaissance food and you know, things like this. The, the distinction between the Renaissance and the Middle Ages wasn't very important to them in these <coughs> fairs and so on. Uh, one of the things that came out of these was everybody wanted to go and see knights joust. And so what developed was what's called now theatrical jousting where these people are not really trying to hurt one another. It's all choreographed, it's all rehearsed, okay, they all, but it's a show, but they're all dressed like knights and so on. And it's very popular at these fairs that still exist. And these troops of knights travel all over the United States at least, starting say like in March in Florida and finishing in October in California. And they travel from one place to another with their horses and, and so on. Okay? This is theatrical jousting. After many, many years of this theatrical jousting existing, uh, some people got the idea that they would actually like to try real jousting. And this is known as full metal jousting <laughs> or uh, these kinds of things. Okay. And these people are, uh, it, it's, it's, you'll see in a minute how violent this is. This is the, it gives you, really when you watch this, you get an idea of what knightly combat in the, in the Middle Ages actually worked, why that worked because you see the force of these people. <clears throat> because if one person says, you know, you've got a 2,000 or, you know, a 1,000 uh, kilo horse with a 150 kilo man, uh, you know, going at one another at 25 miles or 40 kilometers an hour, okay, so that the point of impact is 80 kilometers an hour, and all that force is focused into the end of the lance. Okay, so it actually produces quite an, an impact at the, uh, <coughs> at the end. So there's this full metal jousting, and we're also going to see at the end one of the guys who is the best knight in the world. Uh, he has won the championship in the United States for like the last six years, uh, and is the best knight in the world, at least for the moment. Uh, he's the William Marshall of the 21st century. Um, but he um, is someone who's interesting because he did two tours of duty in Afghanistan with American Special Forces, came back to the United States, joined some sort of police force, uh, that wasn't exciting enough, so he kind of joined a motorcycle gang. Okay. And then after he joined the motorcycle gang, he discovered jousting. Okay. And this was what he was looking for. Okay. It was this. And so he's become the, the best knight in the world. But also looking at him, you get a sense of what medieval knights must have been like. They were these big, bulky, weren't these elegant uh, people that we sometimes think. Now, this first one is the theatrical jousting, and they're talking about how actually hard it is uh, to do this. 
thing that surprised me the most about becoming a knight was how easy the guys made it look and how hard it really was. <laughs> they make it look so graceful and so fluid, all the motion together, and then you get you get on the horse to try to do it, and you're bouncing around. You're like, how do you do? <laughs> so it takes a long time to get the rhythm down and everything. And that was the most surprising part. You ride with your shield all the time, weights on your arms, constant lands up and down all the time, shield work, ground work, running, rehearsing the sword fights, going over the fights over and over and over again, riding your horse over and over and over again. Just that way if something goes wrong, you can adjust or you can identify the problem. Like it was a lot of fun, a lot of hard work. A lot of hard work. The training was to put in night was extremely intense. I had to learn how to ride a horse, which can be, you know, a lot of exercise and painful, but when you have to do that with armor, it just hurt. And they had me up on a horse every week, training, riding, doing exercises, skills with the shield and lance, and I rode one weekend as a knight in Pittsburgh, and I just hurt like I could not believe afterwards. How far you are, look at the line, maybe. not only men who do the jousting, so. Your horse is 2,000 pounds, your opponent's horse is probably about 2,000 pounds, and you're riding at each other at a speed of upwards of 25 miles per hour. All of that is focused in on your lance. <laughs> I think we all are thrill seekers in one form or another. I, I like roller coaster rides, uh, the adrenaline rush, but for me, it's been a constant challenge to get all the technical pieces pulled together. The horse, the, the weight of the lance, the action of the horse coming at you, timing, getting your lance level just at the right time so that you are purchased just right on his breastplate or her breastplate. When all of that comes together, it is such a thrill. Now, it doesn't always come together. So you're constantly trying to get it perfect. And uh, the biggest thrill is when it that magic moment happens. Yeah, again, I would just point out that there's an emotional side to this as well. We not only see them doing this technically, but the reason that you do it is because it's a thrill. Okay? Because there's something, when it comes together, when it's all right, uh, there's a thrill for it. Okay? Now the next day. The interesting thing is that this guy who is basically a thug, okay, is going to explain helmets to you. The armor's built in layers that it actually distributes it off the body. If you took one of these hits in the chest, you'd be dead instantly. 
this arm will need repairing after one match. One match, we'll go out there and pound each other, and something will get broke, and something will get bent. This is a bellows helm. Strongest helm there is to take a shot to the head or the face. The only problem is, is you see these ridges? If Shane or Pat or Brian catches me in those ridges with it, it just rips my head and pretty much takes my head off. And usually where your head goes, the body follows. So if they do try to go for not horsing on me with the saw, it's usually straight into the face and really try to hit me or catch me right on the top of my buff and, and catch me in the head. So not a good design. I really need Shane's helmet, which is a sparrow's beak, which just comes to a point, or even a ship's battle like Brian's. See the difference? See how everything's going to deflect off? So I gotta try to catch him just under that lip to rip his head off, which I can do, but it's just and a little it has harder. Happened. Yeah, and so uh, but if you see this eye slot here, this keeps getting caved in because I've taken three direct hits right to that ocularity, and that will get your blood pumping. Lamke's an idiot and doesn't take care of his armor. He shows up with armor that is just total crap and never is it in working order, so his straps are broken, his pins are broken, the hasp on his visor was broke, so it doesn't pin in, and the whole reason for it pinning in is so it doesn't fly up when you're getting hit. I got hit a couple times in the head without much padding in there, and that shot right to my brain. If that visor flies up on initial hit, that lance snaps and shoots straight into his face, you're dead. In 2007, Paul Allen was killed in the same such jousting incident in Europe. So it's on some of the guys' minds. Okay, so uh, I think that this guy, who has, as far as I know, no real education, I guess you have to go to college to get into special forces, but uh, ends up knowing more, I think, about medieval <coughs> armor than most historians of medieval armor because his life depends on it. Okay. So he actually views this in a very practical, real way and ends up knowing more about this uh, than probably anybody else uh, does at the, at the current time. Okay. We're going to move on to the second part now, and I'll uh, a little quickly. Um, so every narrative is a set of instructions for imagining a world, which may be a historical world, an imaginary world, a plausible or unlikely world. When I hear, read, or see a narrative, I inevitably imagine, even if I do not do so consciously, how I could live in the world I imagine on the basis of those instructions. So when I read any narrative or consume it, see it on TV, go to the movies and see it, when I see a narrative, I inevitably imagine the world to which that narrative refers, which it tells me to imagine. And I imagine how I could live in that world. Who would I be? What would I do? How would I do things? And so on. Uh, this is not a modern idea. Okay? And, or not really <coughs> a modern idea. There are a series of illustrations here from the Middle Ages, and I apologize, this is you know obviously ripped off <coughs> from the internet and so but the, uh, that show us, for example, uh, Marie, Mar Maria of Burgundy reading a book, and then this is what she's imagining. She's reading a prayer book, so she's imagining a scene with the virgin and the child in the background. Okay, And this representation shows us that they, like us, when they read, imagined worlds in their minds. Um, here's another example. Louis d'Orion reading in his Bible and imagining what's happening in the Garden of Eden. <clears throat> and here's another example, which is Jean Foissart writing his histories, and here's what he's imagining as he's writing. Okay. So this notion that we project a world as we read or as we write is, it goes back to uh, the Middle Ages. So when I imagine a world based on the instructions provided by a narrative, the material of the world I imagine its people, places, objects, and actions are ultimately composed of elements drawn from my own experience. Because where else would I, how else could I people this world other than with my own experience? But these are things that I arrange in new configurations according to the narrative's constructions, instructions. The worlds I imagine when I consume stories, in other words, are both familiar and strange. Familiar because they are made of my experience, 
strange because my experience is rearranged in ways that I would probably never have imagined. When I imagine a world on the basis of the instructions provided by a narrative, I present my own experience to myself in a strange, unexpected way. And this rearrangement of my experience enables me to see new possibilities in my everyday reality because I have poured my experience into a mold invented by someone else, have adapted my experience to another way of thinking about experience, have imagined my experience according to the instructions of others. This process of rearranging my experience to imagine a world according to someone else's instructions opens up for me what Paul Ricoeur called new possibilities of being in the world, new forms of life, and gives me new abilities to know myself. This effort to imagine a world on the basis of a narrative's instructions has two extremes. On the one hand, a narrative might provide instructions for imagining a world that seems to have no connection with the world of my daily experience. On the other hand, a narrative might provide instructions for imagining a world that seems to be the world of my everyday experience. In both cases, the effort of imagination will have very little value insofar as it will not open up new opportunities for being in the world for me in the world of my daily experience and will not give me new abilities to know myself. I will profit most in some from a narrative that asks me to imagine a world that is as strange to me as it can be while still maintaining clear links with my world of everyday reality. This effort to imagine a world according to a story's instructions helps me to live better in two ways. First, I see more possibilities than before in the world of everyday experience through this imagination. Consuming a narrative is a way to think imaginatively and creatively about my world, to see it differently, to see things in it that I did not see before. This effort to imagine a world according to the instructions of a narrative also helps me to live better because I generally conceive of my life as if I were a character in a narrative. I imagine myself, when I think about my life, as a character in a narrative. If you ask me who I am, I will probably tell you a story rather than stating my height, weight, and body mass. When I find myself in fa facing an important decision, I normally ask myself what our hero, <coughs> Jeff Riker, would do under these circumstances. And I project the results of different possible decisions in the form of different stories in order to imagine and evaluate the effects of a particular decision. Okay, so I live my life as if I were a character in a story. Okay, and I, well, what if we do this? What if we do this? What if we do this? What are the possibilities? I learned to tell stories about myself and my world by consuming stories of all kind. Stories that I hear, <coughs> that I read, that I see on television and in movies. Stories that I tell myself and tell others. The best ways for me to learn to tell stories is to consume them and tell them. And the broader and deeper my reservoir of stories is, the more I can draw from it to create my own stories about myself and my world. And the shallower my reservoir of stories, the more limited my vision of the world and the range of actions I can imagine in it will be. If, for example, a child whose narrative repertoire consists solely of cartoons with the Ninja Turtles or the Power Rangers. This is the only narratives the child has ever consumed. And I assume you, at least one of those has a reference for you, right? Okay, okay. So, uh, so the only thing that this child has ever seen are Ninja Turtle cartoons or Power Ranger cartoons. That's it. Okay. If this child uh, is confronted with a conflict only way he or she will know how to resolve the conflict is through violence. That's because that's the only model, the only way of thinking about this that the child has been given. And what I used to do with my son when he would play video games where you blow things up, okay, and so on, is I, I never, at least I don't think I ever did tell our children that they couldn't do something, okay, but I would stand behind him and I would 
you know, say, this looks really stupid, or, you know, what, and, uh, but I would also, he'd be playing for a while, and he'd be blowing things up, or killing monsters, or whatever, and I'd say, well, where's the negotiate button? Okay, and on these video games, there's never a negotiate button. Okay, that's not part of what you learn by playing these games, is to negotiate. So every story I consume enables me to imagine another way of being in the world and helps me to tell more sophisticated stories about myself and my life. Where can we look for narratives that instruct us to imagine worlds that are strange, but not too strange, worlds that are strange enough to be useful? We should look above all, in my opinion, to narratives of the past and of other cultures although the effectiveness of any given narrative to enrich one's daily world will vary from person to person. For one person, the narratives that will most effectively open up for him or her new possibilities of being in the world will be French novels of the 12th century. For another, it will be contemporary, ultra-unreal Chinese narratives. For another, it will be 18th century African epic poems. For yet another, it will be 20th century Ar Argentinian soap operas and so on. What is important is to preserve this diversity and make it as accessible as possible so that everyone can deepen his or her narrative reservoir. I would suggest, moreover, that as the world becomes more homogenous, which is happening at an appalling rate, but <coughs> as the world becomes more homogenous, the past has become and will continue to become an increasingly important source of difference for us. As we move forward in time, the only thing that's becoming more different is the past. And the present is becoming. I, I, I went to high school in Brussels, and when I went there in high school, this was in another, uh, not only another century, another millennia. Uh, uh, when I went there to high school, it was a big deal. I got to call my parents. Uh, you know, for five minutes once every two weeks. Uh, you know, I was really well, far away from them and cut off from them. Whereas I lead a study program now to France fairly often. The students call their parents before they get on the plane. They call their parents after they get off the plane. I mean, they, they call their parents when they get up in the morning. You know, there's no disconnection. But when I went to Brussels for the first time in high school, it was a visually and architecturally and culturally, it was a very, very different place. I go back now, and it seems to me like Connecticut, where I'm from, the States. I mean, differences have been wiped out in 30, 35 years to an astonishing uh, degree. Um, <clears throat> okay, so I, would, I just want to show you now are some examples of ways that the Middle Ages has provided people with the ability to <coughs> create things in the present world that they would not have been able to create, or at least in the same way, without medieval stimulus. And in these cases, you'll see artists, again, the start of these Renaissance fairs, what happened in these Renaissance fairs is they wanted to sell medieval jewelry. So they started doing these replicas of what they thought were you know, medieval jewelry and selling these things. But then with time, after these people have been working at this, these jewelers have been making these things time and time and time and time again, these replicas, they decided to start creating original jewelry, but there was actually original medieval jewelry. Jewelry, because they were using the medieval models, the medieval materials, the medieval techniques to create <coughs> contemporary jewelry. Okay? And the same thing you'll see here with a musician, and I'll tell you more about this in a minute, using medieval music, not trying to replicate it, but using it to create very contemporary uh, kinds of music. So the first thing here is uh, at the Royal Jewelry <coughs> School, they have a Royal Jewelry School in England, okay, in Birmingham, they had a competition to create new jewelry based on jewelry from an Anglo-Saxon hoard that they had discovered. So the students were not to replicate this jewelry, but to use this jewelry as an inspiration for their own work. And here are the three winning uh, examples uh, of that. Um, this is, there was a special issue of Metal Smith Magazine, which is the official magazine of the American Goldsmith Association. Okay, so these are very high level uh, craftsmen and artisans and so on. And they had a special issue devoted to gothic jewelry, sinister pleasures. Okay? And this was the cover of this. Okay? And I'll show you two other examples of their creations. Uh, here's something that was created that has been shown in this magazine and so on. Here's another one. Okay? So these are not 
medieval pieces of jewelry, but they were inspired by medieval jewelry. It helped the artists think in ways they would not have been able to do otherwise. Another one, I think this is particularly useful if you're going out in the evening. <laughs> Uh, and then it also carries over into fashion. I think it was 2012 that was like the medieval fashion year. And for some reason, all the designers in Paris decided they were going to be doing medieval-inspired fashion. Okay, and so this is one example of it. Um, here's another example. Another, I think this is actually magnificent. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then we have the medieval fashion show. Next clips, and I'll go through these quickly, are of a musician, an avant, well, contemporary, contemporary composer, a French composer, who, um, in order to create this work, the, it's in three parts. And one part of it, what he did, is he went to uh, a manuscript, a medieval manuscript of Guillaume Machaut, who was the great uh, 14th century French musician and poet and so on. And he uh, photographed a part of the manuscript which he then turned into a digitalized uh, piece, of, digitalized and put on paper. He then have a, has a pen with a little camera in it, and he would retrace the manuscript with this pen. The information would be sent to a computer program they have at IRCAM in Paris, which is the, the big experimental music uh, group in Paris. And this computer program would then be used to generate a score which would be given to musicians to sing and to perform. Okay. So what they are singing and performing is not Machaut's music, but the visual representation, the writing, the transcript of Machaut's music. And then what he did to create the piece was put together Machaut's music, and they actually performed medieval <coughs> music in sort of a medieval style, and then another set of poems, 19th century poems, which he set to music a few years ago. And then in the end, you hear them performing the, the transcription uh, of the music. And I couldn't get this in English, unfortunately, so you have to bear with me at that time. Monté. So Ça here's the, de, de papier that was the paper, the interactive paper that they have. La page est imprimée avec une trame de tout petits points qui en fait sont comme un code barre en deux dimensions. Et le stylo, lui, il a une caméra dans la pointe. Quand on écrit sur la feuille avec ce stylo, on est capable de récupérer le geste de l'écriture, donc euh, vraiment d'accéder à la vitesse, au trait et à la position dans l'espace du dessin. Et donc le, le but ici, c'est de redessiner par-dessus des formes déjà existantes. Donc euh, par exemple comme ceci, on va dessiner tout un set et de récupérer via le logiciel en fait et vraiment la dynamique d'écriture de ce geste donc le geste de l'écriture so this is the computer program then that it's fed into envoyer sur l'ordinateur dans, dans l'application qui lui va calculer quel type de forme 
On a cette forme-là, qui est dessinée comme ça, donc qui correspond sur la partition, sur le manuscrit de Machot, qui correspond à ce, cet élément-là, et qui nous donne donc des trajectoires qui sont utili utilisées là directement par les voix sous forme de glisser. So this is them singing what was written. On part cette fois d'un homme qui est un punctum et qui donne donc ces trajectoires là. Si je les lis de façon un peu plus dynamique, c'est comme ça. Et donc là, ce sont le violoncelle et la guitare en fait qui suivent exactement les contours de ce nœud. This is the medieval part. Actually, use the computer to generate also where the sound comes from. La construction générale du programme, c'est en fait, c'est une tresse à trois brins. Un des brins, c'est le composer d'Al, du XIVe siècle. Le deuxième brin, c'est une pièce que j'ai composée sur des poèmes de, 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 de Jean Grosjean, euh, qui est une pièce qui a 5-6 ans. C'est la seconde partie. Et puis, le troisième brin, c'est une pièce de Catherine et qui est vraiment écrite là maintenant euh, avec une, une, des, des, des outils vraiment de maintenant avec de l'électronique etc. Donc ces, ces, trois, ces trois éléments en fait, se, se succèdent, parfois se superposent, s'articulent entre eux, de façon à composer en fait, une seule musique. Ça crée une espèce de, de champ de force, de continuité entre les éléments, et en même temps ça crée des espèces de court-circuit temporel. Parce que So, but what's interesting to me about all three of these art situations is that these, again, are not people creating replicas, but taking something medieval and using it to create something new. The, the, the medieval part becomes a kind of provocation or inspiration for doing something new, for helping them compose something they would, or create something they would not have been otherwise able to create. Okay? The last part, and I'll do this really quickly without notes and hope I don't forget too much. Um, There is a sculptor in uh, uh, medieval Burgundy called Giselbertus of Auton, from the town of Auton. <coughs> and he's known as the great sculptor of, uh, uh, at least of the Romanesque uh, Middle Ages. This is probably his most famous sculpture, which is the sculpture of Eve. And uh, it's the first female nude that we know of since antiquity. Um, I won't go into the whole thing, but art historians sort of salivate whenever they uh, <laughs> see this as well. Um, this is another one of his sculptures, possibly, where you have the angel and the three wise men, and the angel is waking one of the wise men up by touching him on the finger and showing him the star uh, up on the top there. Um, this is his most famous work, which is the western portal of the Cathedral of Autant with the Last Judgment. Um, 
And uh, you know, here you have an angel dividing the people who have been saved who will go to heaven from the damned uh, who will go to hell. And you have Christ in majesty up here. And we'll see this in a minute, but written right here at the feet of Christ is in Latin, Giselbertus hoc feci. Giselbertus made this. Okay. And it's, this is very bizarre. Okay. It's the first signed, if it, if it is signed, first signed work we have by a sculptor uh, in the Middle Ages. But also to put this right at the feet of Christ uh, seems a little, uh, I don't know, <laughs> strange. Um, so here, again, you can see the angel separating the damned from the saved, and you find up there, Giselbertus hoc feci, um, another uh, glance at that, okay. And what is important, I'll put that in um, What's important here is that this is absolutely vague. This is a perfect text. Giselbertus made this. Who's Giselbertus? We don't know. I mean, Giselbertus were here, I could say, that's Giselbertus. But you don't, so you have to imagine who Giselbertus is. Made this. This what? Okay. Some people have imagined that it means the West Portal. Some people have imagined it means every, all the sculptures in the church. One person, a famous art historian, wrote a book in 1999 saying, no, 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 he's the patron, he's not the sculptor. Okay. So none of the sculptor was done, so we don't know the name of the sculptor. But what, what these, these, so you, you have this Giselbertus hoc feci, which is a perfect example for me of the past. And we have to imagine who, and we have to imagine what. And different people are going to imagine different who's, and different people are going to imagine different what's. And who we imagine, and what we imagine, and the world we imagine that this took place in, okay, are ways for us to think and don't really have anything to do with, with the Middle Ages, or very little to do with the Middle Ages, because they don't exist. Okay, there's no way to, to, no way to, if we have an idea about who Giselbertus is, there's no way to test it. Okay, it has to be imagined. And this imagining of this lost, disappeared world okay, enables us to think better about our world uh, now. Okay, so that's it. So what I say corresponds to what? Politically very dangerous. Pardon me? Politically, again, we see these days, mm -hmm. this can be quite a problem. Yeah, yeah no, I mean, and, 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 but, it, but I think that that's, that's our only criteria is, is right. what I called it, what, in one point what I call it, um, I forget, something about hyper-subjectivity. In other words, it's, it's subjective, but it's collectively subjective as yes. well as individually subjective. But you, you, you've showed and told us about this guy. He would have been in a gang, right? <laughs> if it hadn't been for him doing this armor mm -hmm. thing. And you said that he probably knew more about armor because his life depended on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Mm -hmm. But I don't think so. <laughs> We're at a university. There might be people who have collected many, many armors, described them, and, 
and notified how it got developed and where it was found and what kind of relationship there was about uh, this development of armor. Mm -hmm. And uh, I still believe that there might be a few people at university who know more. Well, I mean, certainly he, certainly he knows less about the metallurgy, about the about how to make the armor, I think, than, than people here, some people here might, might do. But in terms of using it, you know, that is, that if, he can, if you show him three helmets, he's going to say, I want that one. And he's going to be able to tell you why he wants that one <coughs> rather, than, rather than this one. So it's, it's a kind of knowledge that I don't think can be developed other than in practice. Um, but in other ways, for the metallurgy or for the development, the historical development, let's say, of the armor or something like that, he probably knows less, yes. I would say that the ones who had the helmets where you get your head ripped off, or, <laughs> and well, they probably died out. So, <laughs> <laughs> so you would see so the development sure. <laughs> of better helmets, and you would, as a researcher, search for an explanation for and find it. Okay. <laughs> Come on. Thanks for an interesting presentation. I was wondering what are the insights that he discovered because you looked at medieval times and that you could not discover by looking at, let's say, the Roman times or the Greek times or any other times. Right. This, uh, this is something I really don't have time to go into, but it's um, historical periods for us have become aesthetic, peri uh, uh, aesthetic domains. So that when I, th I often start classes by asking s students, for example, um, uh, you know, when you think of the Middle Ages, what do you think of? And they think of castles, they think of knights. And, you know, if you were to ask them, if you think of the Roman Empire, what do you think of? They might think of legions, they might think of Caesar, they might think of togas. Uh, so they already had castles as well. <laughs> but, uh, but so I think that, that for us now, it's almost been, what I sometimes say is that it's like if we're going to go out for dinner tonight, we say, do we want to go out and have Chinese food? Do we want to have Indian food? Do we want to have Danish food? Do we want to have Mexican food? You know, what do we want to have when we go out tonight? And the, the past has become almost like this, that people think, you know, do I want to think of knights and castles? Do I want to think of legions and emperors? Do I want to think of people in powdered wigs with rapiers, uh, you know, so it's become kind of, so there, there are differences in these different periods for us, which is also why I'm going to be more interested in the 12th century in France, uh, and someone else is going to be more interested in the 15th century in Poland, and somebody else more in the 19th century in England, because we have emotional or aesthetic responses to these, uh, to these periods. Uh, um, I mean, I think, for example, well, yeah, so, so that would, I would say that that was, so there are differences between these periods. It's not that they're all the same, but they all, I would say, function in an analogous way for us. I think we uh, can stop there. Thank you once more. And um, there is uh, something tangible. Yes. <laughs> uh, and, um, and everybody is invited upstairs to uh, 